Good morning, everyone. Wherever we are in Australia, we are on the lands of the First Nations peoples. Here in Parramatta this morning, I am on the land of the Darug people of the Darug Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Leanne Smith, and I'm the director of the Whitlam Institute within Western Sydney University, and I'm the former chief of policy and best practice for United Nations peacekeeping. Welcome to this first plenary session for day two of the Australian Sustainable Partnership Forum. I hope you all enjoyed the fantastic sessions that were held yesterday. I'm sure we all learnt a lot. This morning, though, at this first plenary session, we are here to discuss the national focus for how we can partner for a more socially, economically and environmentally sustainable future for Australia, where no one is left behind. As all of you will know, there are currently a lot of Australians being left behind. This session is about how Australia can better deliver on the SDGs for all Australians. The session uses as a focal point recent research conducted by the Whitlam Institute within Western Sydney Uni, which explores international best practice by national governments around the world in terms of how they implement the SDGs, with the goal of informing better national policy and practice in Australia. Let me briefly introduce our fantastic expert panel to you, and you can find more detail about their accomplishments in the speaker profiles that are on the forum website. Dr. Claire Brolin is, research fellow, is a research fellow at the Centre for Policy Futures at the University of Queensland. Dr. Brolin was the lead researcher on this research project, which is called No One Left Behind, Implementing the Sustainable Development Goals in Australia. She completed her PhD in postdoctoral studies on the formulation and implementation of the SDG 2030 agenda through a global health and rights lens. Claire's a leading Australian researcher and thinker on SDG policy and planning at the University of Queensland. Cassandra Goldie is the CEO of ACOS, the Australian Council of Social Services. With public policy expertise in economic and social issues, civil society, social justice and human rights, Cassandra has represented the interests of people who are disadvantaged and civil society generally in major national and international processes, as well in grassroots communities. Her work in Australian communities as, is at the coalface of why the SDGs exist and why they matter for Australia. Kylie Porter is the Executive Director of the Global Compact Network Australia, the GCNA, the Australian local network of the UN Global Compact. She's a sustainability expert and business leader holding particular expertise in delivering responsible business and corporate responsibility strategies and guiding businesses on reputation risk management for environmental, social and governance issues. A bit on the structure of our session today, I'm going to give a brief introduction to why we did this research. Then I'll hand over to Dr. Brolin to speak for about 10 minutes on how she conducted the research, her methodology, and what her key findings and recommendations for Australia were. And then next we'll engage in a panel-wide discussion about the Australian context for about half an hour, and then we'll open up to questions from all of you participating in the session. So please feel free to, um, to share with us some robust questions for the discussion. So why we conducted the research. In 2015, Australia, alongside 192 other countries, came together at the High Level Sustainable Development Summit in New York to commit to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. As former New Zealand Prime Minister Helen Clark said at that summit, sustainable development in the 21st century is not something which happens to somebody else, somewhere else. We all have a stake in it and every country has work to do to progress it. And yet, in this country, at the federal level, on both sides of politics, the SDGs continue to be treated as a foreign policy and an international development issue, something Australia should support in other countries, not a responsibility for domestic law and policy. It is true, as the plenary panel yesterday, partnering with the UN and International Focus noted, that Australia submitted its first voluntary national report on the SDGs in 2019. 
And I encourage you all to look at that report and assess it for yourself. The fact remains that the Australian government, more than five years after it adopted the SDGs, has still not released a national SDG plan of action. There are still no planning or accountability mechanisms for the SDGs. There is no SDG related financing in the national budget. In 2018, a federal parliamentary inquiry into Australia's SDG implementation made 18 recommendations based on 164 submissions. Unfortunately, these recommendations and the hard work that went into those submissions were dismissed in a dissenting report by the coalition members of that committee in 2019. However, one of those recommendations was that Australia should look to the best practice examples from other countries to enhance its own implementation strategy. This research is an offering of international best practice governance, policy and planning for SDG implementation, examining the practice of a broad and diverse range of countries, but with a focus on Mexico, Indonesia and Germany. I hope you'll take the time to look at the research um, and, and I hope you find it interesting. We welcome your feedback. Carriage for the SDGs at the federal level sits jointly with DFAT and the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet as co-leads for an interdepartmental coordination committee. In my own view, it should be those federal departments leading this conversation today on national approaches. It's great that there is some DFAT participation in the conference over these two days, but sadly, no one from Prime Minister and Cabinet was able to attend this incredible forum, let alone present their strategy for domestic implementation of the SDGs. So unfortunately, it remains for civil society, subnational governments, academia and business to keep taking the lead on the SDGs. So I'll finish up my, my introductory remarks with a challenge to all of you participating in this conference. How can we all get Australian political leaders and policy makers at the federal level to integrate the SDGs and its social, economic and environmental pillars into our national policy for the benefit of all Australians. So with that introduction, Claire, over to you. Thanks so much, Leanne. And my thanks as well to the United Nations Association of Australia for hosting this really important uh, forum. And good morning, everyone. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm beaming to you all from this morning, the Kwandamuka peoples. I pay my deep respects to Kwandamuka elders, past, present and emerging. There are a lot of country and global happening with regard country SDG implementation and to country SDG deficits. But through this research, we really wanted to demonstrate to the Australian government and to the world how SDG planning and implementation can indeed occur and how countries are taking SDG implementation, particularly at the national level, seriously. What I really like about our research project is that it that is presented on your screen is that it identifies and investigates how countries are rolling up their sleeves and getting on with the hard business. And let me emphasize hard business of SDG implementation at a national policy planning and governance level. As you can see on your screen, our research had four parts. To identify which three countries we wanted to do a deep dive into in terms of best practice SDG policy and planning, we turned to the 164 written submissions to the Australian Parliamentary Inquiry into the SDGs held in 2018. The 164 submissions to that inquiry were lodged by probably many of you watching today by Australian business and industry organisations, civil society, private citizens, peak bodies, government departments and academia. And submissions were to respond to eight terms of reference. And for the purposes of our project, we analysed responses to the eighth, the eighth inquiry question or terms of reference that sought examples of best practice in how other countries are implementing the SDGs from which Australia could learn. Now, three best practice countries that inquiry stakeholders from Australia repeatedly highlighted, Germany, Mexico, and Indonesia, 
were subsequently identified and selected to become the focus of our third research component. And this involved conducting a series of key informant interviews with high level SDG related policymakers and multi stakeholders, including from business and the civil society from the three countries. And what we really wanted to know from these key informants was what did they think were the key ingredients, the levers, the enablers for SDG policy and planning momentum and government appetite to implement the 2030 agenda in their respective nations. In conducting the case study research, we acknowledge that every country's political government structure, development, socioeconomic, demographic contexts and so on are unique and different. But no less, no less, what can we learn in Australia and what can the international community more broadly learn from Mexico, Germany and Indonesia's SDG leadership? Okay, let's turn to the findings of best practice from our, from our country case studies. And let's first look at Australia's near neighbour, Indonesia. So what can we learn here in Australia from Indonesia's SDG implementation? Well, let me tell you, we can learn a lot from Indonesia. Um, and in the current defence and security policy climate in Canberra, our federal government is increasingly invested in finding diverse strategic ways to partner with Indonesia on multiple fronts. So to set the scene, Indonesia is the world's fourth most populous country with over 270 million people living in 34 provinces across the Indonesian island archipelago. Its governance system is very much decentralised, like Australia, and Indonesia is an emerging middle income country and home to the world's 10th largest economy and the largest economy in Southeast Asia. From the research, there were a number of findings as to the key enablers for SDG success in that country. But on your screen, I flagged three key enablers. But one of those enablers particularly stood out to me, and that is Presidential Decree number 59 of 2017. Now, this presidential decree mandates in Indonesian law that the SDGs be implemented at the national, regional and municipal or local government level in that country. This law was passed by President Jokowi in July 2017. So in that country, one of our nearest neighbours, the SDG agenda is not a matter of policy, it's mandated through law by the President himself. The presidential decree mandates that every level of government must prepare an SDG action plan, must report on that plan, and there's also a very strong focus on SDG financing especially to reduce financing gaps and implement innovative SDG financing collaborations and solutions between and among government, industry and the private sector. Now, the presidential decree makes Bapanis' life very easy. And Bapanis is Indonesia's Ministry for National Development Planning. And Bapanis is tasked with leading SDG implementation across national government departments, as well as integrating SDG implementation downstream at provincial and local government levels and among key stakeholders. So imagine, imagine in Australia, if SDG implementation was legislated, we had a national ministry dedicated to SDG or sustainable development implementation, working across ministerial departments and working in partnership with governments and local and state levels, which use the language of the SDG, SDG agenda in all that it did. Let's turn to the country case study of Mexico. Again, to set the scene, Mexico is an upper middle income country with almost 130 million people. It's the second largest economy in Latin America, 11th largest in the world. Like Australia, Mexico is a federation of states with strong traditions of local autonomy. And it's also found on the Pacific Rim and part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement that is that Australia is also part of. Interestingly, Mexico also featured in Australia's first voluntary national report on the SDGs to the UN of July 2018 in the report section on section on SDG 17, Partnerships for the Goals. There, the Australian government talks about its engagement in the innovative MICTA partnership, M-I-K-T-A partnership, with MICTA bringing together the countries of Mexico, Indonesia, the Republic of Korea, Turkey and Australia to build consensus on complex and challenging issues, drawing on the diverse perspectives, particularly 
around sustainable development. What stood out to me about SDG implementation in Mexico is that Mexico has a national SDG budgetary planning process. So having an SDG policy roadmap is one thing. Having SDG implementation as a matter of law is another. But having your national treasury, your ministry of finance link all budget allocations with localised or country contextual SDG targets with a view to strengthen strategic planning and SDG m and &E among Mexico's different ministries, that's groundbreaking. Because we know as policy pragmatists, it's all about the bottom line and talking in the language and finance and economics, especially to policy makers and our political leaders in this country. So we need to talk about SDG investment more so than ever as we are in a period of global economic uncertainty. Key informants from Mexico further spoke to us about the importance of this budgetary activity because it drove the business of doing the SDGs within government of SDG education and awareness raising among policymakers and facilitated close collaboration across government, government ministries and with stakeholders beyond government, especially the private sector. The fact that policymakers in Mexico can make visible the connection between budgetary investment and achievement of localised, let me emphasise localised SDG targets, that's golden. Which leads to our third and final case study country, Germany. <clears throat> Germany is a high income country like Australia, an EU heavy hitter and a very important political ally and trading partner to our country, Australia. Like Australia, Germany is a federation of states with strong traditions of local autonomy at the state and municipal government level. But unlike Australia, Germany's first national German sustainable development strategy that included national sustainability goals and targets was launched in 2002 and was revised and updated every four years thereafter. And what I really want to emphasise here with Germany, and we also find this to be the case with Mexico and Indonesia, is Germany has a strong history of political and policy commitment to sustainable development. So when the SDG agenda was introduced to the world in September 2015, it was a development agenda that the German government was already heavily invested in. Uh, one key informant um, from Germany, uh, a heavy hitter, I have to say, who's uh, engaged on a daily basis in, in sustainable development futures planning, in fact, laughed and said, who invests in coal these days? It's not the future. What really stands out to me as a key SDG enabler is Germany's Parliamentary Advisory Council on Sustainable Development. Again, this high level Parliamentary Advisory Council embeds greater accountability and transparency around the German government's SDG implementation activities. For example, this council is tasked to evaluate the federal government's mandatory sustainability impact assessments. The German government uses these assessments as the lens in which to examine each piece of draft legislation to see whether the proposed laws are to beneficially or not so beneficially impact on sustainable, de sustainable development and SDG impact in, and implementation in that country. Could you imagine if we had a similar parliamentary advisory body on sustainable development in Australia? Also in Germany, the taxonomy of sustainable development and sustainability by government is very clear with some flexibility. This is enormously beneficial for Germany's massive corporate and private sector powerhouse in engaging with the SDG agenda and interrelated ESG agendas, sustainable financing agendas with governments, with shareholders and with the German community. This also prevents greenwashing when we have a clear taxonomy around sustainability because there is a harmonised approach to sustainability between the German government and the business community and the public. Finally, and very briefly, I want to speak to what I see as really the key innovation of our studies um, uh, output, which is the SDG momentum matrix. This is actually found on page 32 of the Whitlam Institute report and a shortened version is on your screen. So after we developed our three country case study findings, 
we synthesized all three research component findings on good practice SDG policy and planning to create an SDG momentum matrix. The matrix is a really practical tool that identifies and sets out the key indicators of best practice SDG governance, policy and planning as found by our study. And the SDG momentum matrix can assist policymakers and other SDG stakeholders in any country of the world to engage in constructive policy discussions around why or why not, or how a good practice SDG indicator is being adopted in and to a particular country and that country's that in terms of that country's development context. So for example, if I was a civil society actor in Malaysia, I could pick up the SDG momentum matrix and assess whether or if Malaysia is implementing any of the good practice indicators or a localized contextualized version of that indicator, or maybe doing something even better than the indicator described to generate government accountability and transparency and momentum for genuine SDG achievement. So that's all for me. I'll hand back to Leanne so we can begin our panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Claire, for bringing that research to life. And again, um, I'd really encourage you uh, to take a look, uh, particularly at the matrix that Claire developed. It's a really practical and handy tool for anybody advocating for the SDGs. So let's turn to our fantastic panel now. Um, I wanted to start off um, by asking uh, Cassandra and Claire first a question. Um, welcome to the screen, Cassandra, Claire. Um, good morning, Leanne. Hi. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hi, Leanne. So um, maybe, Cassie, you can kick us off with this first question. What do the SDGs mean to you um, as CEO of ACOS? Why are they important for your work? And which are the most important for relevant to the work you do? Mm. Look, thanks, Leanne, and can I um, thank everybody for the opportunity to be a part of this great panel. Congratulations, Claire, on that really important research, and can I acknowledge I'm on Gadigal land and pay respects to Elders past and present. Um, and um, ACOS has a very clear um, commitment to using the SDGs um, as a framework for us to measure um, and to track our own um, goals and what we are trying to achieve at the national level. Um, we've, we've partnered with UNAA and um, the Global Compact and the Sustainable um, Development um, SDSN on two major events after the SDGs were introduced. First of all, in 2016, um, I was very struck at that time that we had engagement from the federal government from the DFAT part of government, but not domestically. Of course, one of the really important things about the SDG is it is a national framework as well as a, um, a, um, a, a sort of a development agenda for countries like Australia in terms of their engagement in our region and globally. So um, it was disappointing at that time that we didn't have that kind of engagement from the uh, relevant ministers um, in terms of a domestic focus. Um, and not long after that, actually, actually we had um, the um, uh, new Minister for Social Services um, engage in a debate about, um, because, of course, poverty is the core goal for us. And, um, in fact, in our strategic plan, we've internally adopted um, that um, our purpose is to try and achieve by 2030 um, a reduction by at least half of the proportion of people living in poverty and then secondly to progressively achieve and sustain income growth for the 40% of the population with the lowest incomes at a rate higher than the national average. And for example, I gave an interview yesterday to the ABC Business um, Program talking about what we were seeing post, um, you know, the cutting of JobKeeper and the cutting back of job seeker, and I spoke exactly to that agenda about you know what we need to be doing is focusing on lifting up the incomes of the bottom forty percent of the community. Now, mind you, I didn't say to the journalist, and that is because it's in the SDGs goal number, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Might have lost you know the interest, but it is definitely internally for us a core policy framework. 
um, about what we are here to achieve. Um, and we have used that in our advocacy with successive uh, ministers. There's been a number of ministers for social service, um, in case you missed it, over the last decade since the SDGs were adopted. And so when Minister Porter came into the portfolio, it was not long after that first national summit that we were involved in to try and promote the SDGs nationally. Um, and to our significant disappointment, that minister said he rejected the notion of poverty being a... Uh, um, relevant to his portfolio um, and he said that the goal was self-reliance and that that would be the goal that he would be pursued by this government when it came, for example, to the design of Social Security. And, of course, it doesn't take much for you to see that self-reliance can be, well, just being cut off from income support, which doesn't necessarily equate to actually a reduction in poverty. And in fact, in a, in a practical sense, we're very worried by the way in which Social Security is being designed and implemented in a way that is very likely, again, to, to lead to large numbers of people disconnecting with income support because they've either been cut off or they have given up because it is too toxic an environment for them to be in. Um, and the most recent Minister for Social Service um, and Rustin has expressed very similar views. As you would know, one of the core goals for um, uh, obligations on a national government is the very basics is to start to develop a national measure of poverty. Because, of course, if you don't have a definition of what you're trying to achieve, then you don't actually get made to be accountable um, against that goal. And um, Fran Kelly very recently interviewed the Minister for Social Service about, um, you know, what her approach was to poverty, the fact that with the cutting back of Job Seeker, which, of course, has been cut back to a brutal $44 a day now, um, it was a crucial sort of income protection for people, um, the Minister rejected the notion that as poverty of being a relevant measure um, and rejected that being used in any way to design policies associated with Social Security. So we are not even past the first post when it comes to the National Government of Australia, which at the moment has essentially in a domestic context just rejected even goal one of um, poverty reduction. But we continue to speak up about that and I think it's extremely important in terms of how do we use this um, you know, it is what holds us to account. What matters, um, we think that these are global targets and frameworks that are, have been really well developed and they are relevant to the quality of people's lives. Um, and you will see all around domestically now in Australia, we have leading um, advocates and academics speaking to the issue of poverty, speaking to the issue of whether or not policies are increasing or worsening Poverty, um, for example, the ANU has recently done work which has highlighted, it was just out in the last couple of days, which has highlighted that because of the government approach to Social Security, we will have about 40% of children in single parent families punch back below what we all consider to be um, the correct measure of poverty at a national level. And so it's extremely important in our view, um, but we do have our work cut out for us in terms of getting a national government to take up this agenda. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks, Cassandra. Kylie, how about for, for you and your work? What do the SDGs mean for that work and, and what, are the, what are the most important SDGs in relation to your work? No, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Leanne. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. For me, that's the um, that's the Gadol people of the Wurundjeri Nation. So I think, Leanne, look, similar to, um, to Cass, that there are certain SDGs that are far more relevant to our work, predominantly because of the way in which business can really contribute to the SDGs. So first of all, I think it's really important to understand that the UN Global Compact, of which the GCNA is a local network of, we were, you know, in UN terms, given the official mandate to the UN to work with businesses to help them integrate the SDGs into their strategy and operations. So for us, what that means is helping business understand how to integrate a principles-based approach to business. So this means helping them understand what acting responsibly means by advancing things like human rights, labour, environment and anti-corruption and taking action that advances societal goals. And the SDGs are really the lighthouse for that. 
So even though um, there are SDGs that are very intertwined with human rights, and Cass talked about those with relation to no poverty, there are specific SDGs around labour, around environment, around anti-corruption, and human rights is really spread across that. So for us, I really see the role as being helping business deliver on the ambition needed to address the SDGs and sustainable development more broadly, and really helping to ensure that they're integrating and advocating for economic growth, and that being exclusive, inclusive, I should say, economic growth, but also being accountable to their values. So we need to ensure that business are doing what they say they're doing, that they're reporting on that effectively, that they are actually um, contributing to the to the SDGs. And it's also important because that we know that businesses have the financial capital to drive innovative solutions to these intractable problems. And this could be through making their own investments, it could be through multi-stakeholder partnerships or a combination of both. So the SDGs are estimated to drive about US 12 trillion in opportunities, predominantly in the energy, cities, food, agriculture, health and wellbeing sectors, which is a really huge opportunity to drive progress at scale. So in terms of specific SDGs, you know, to your, your point, um, Leanne, it's very easy for um, a company to say, well, we're contributing to you know, all 17 goals, but there is a question mark there about, well, if you're contributing positively to all of the SDGs, where are you having a negative impact and what are you doing to, um, to protect against that? So from a UN Global Compact perspective, we released our new strategy um, earlier this year. And within that, there are five what we call lead and shape SDGs. So these are the SDGs that on a global level, but also at a local network level, we have the skills and the capabilities and the capacity to work with business to truly integrate and have a really positive shift in these SDGs. And so for us, those SDGs are um, SDG 5 on gender, gender equality, um, and that's, that's particularly relevant for a lot of the, um, the countries in the developing world, but also the developed world. And that's, that's really about ensuring equity in that space. And it ties very strongly um, into, into reducing inequalities too. The second one is SDG 9, which is around decent work and economic growth. So again, this one, um, it's obviously, you know, even by the title, we can tell that it links into business. But the really good part, well, the really vital part about that from a um, GCNA perspective is the link to, um, to reducing or, you know, um, removing modern slavery and human trafficking. And so in Australia, we do an awful lot of work with business in that space, but also with um, Australian Border Force um, and to a certain extent DFAT through the Bali process. Then the next one is SDG 13 around climate action, which is, is critical. We know that um, setting, you know, very aggressive targets on reducing climate emissions will actually have positive benefits across a lot of the SDGs. And then SDG 16, which is peace, justice and strong institutions. So this talks very strongly to the anti-bribery and corruption work that we do here. Um, which is actually a public-private partnership um, called the Bribery Prevention Network, which I can talk about later, but the government is involved in that. And then the last one, which is the obvious one, is, is partnerships for the goals, because we know that without partnerships, um, we're not going to achieve what we have to achieve in the next nine years. Thanks, Kylie. That's really helpful information for people involved um, across all the sectors. Um, look, we know as reflected by the participation in this forum over these two days, that um, civil society, academia, um, local government, um, business are, are really engaged in raising awareness about SDGs and reporting against SDGs. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask all three of you actually um, this last question before I go to the Q&A, which is what difference would it make? Why is national leadership important for setting the course for Australia's economic, environmental and socially sustainable future? And what kind of things could the Australian government 
government be doing to support the implementation of the SDGs to ensure no one's left behind? Is it, as, is it just about awareness raising? Is it acknowledging that this is an international obligation we've undertaken? Is it more than that? Can you give us some examples um, of, of what, what difference it would make if we had strong federal leadership on this? And um, I don't know who'd like to start with that question, but maybe, maybe you, Claire, seeing as um, you've been quite raw. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Um, thanks, Leanne. I think the key question for me is that the agenda asks countries and at least Australia's federal government an uncomfortable question to not only shift away from but stop doing economic, social, including health and well-being and environmental policy and planning in departmental silos because this approach is no longer fit for purpose if it ever was for purpose, in terms of facing the complex, wholly integrated short and long-term challenges, including health and wellbeing challenges. And obviously I'm going to emphasize health and wellbeing because um, I'm a policy and health access and equity specialist facing all of us in Australia and all on our planet that our continent is part of now and for future generations. And I think it's that paradigm shift that the SDG agenda is asking and demanding of our government. And, and doing integrated cross-departmental, multi-sectoral, economic, social, environmental planning and policy for sustainable development is hard and it's uncomfortable. It's not what our policymakers and bureaucrats train to do. We do development, we do development in our international agenda. The SDG agenda is saying, yes, continue to do development, to continue to integrate the SDGs into your uh, uh, ODA and um, international aid uh, portfolios, but it's us to do it at home. So sustainable development is not only DFAT's remit uh, to address economic, social, environmental concerns and disparities and equities in our own backyards and to generate transformative, integ integrated, intergenerational economic, social, environmental opportunities, good health and well-being will, will really really, um, for me, uh, require a pivot um, in the way that we we do policy in this country. We need to do policy that's fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, if anything, COVID-19 and the need for a health, in, or a health in all policies approach, for example, demonstrates, demonstrates that. And I think what I really enjoyed from some of the transcripts I read from the German key informants was that stated that doing sustainable development policy and planning creates some very uncomfortable conversations. Um, but those uncomfortable conversations um, at the policy and planning level within government, across government departments, with government, external partners, is really important. Thanks, Claire. Leanne, Thanks. I might just... Um Go next if that's okay. Yeah. I, um, I, I, I think it's extremely important that um, the national government puts itself at the centre of the program of work that's needed and to create a culture of expectation about collaboration associated with the delivery of these goals. Um, Often what can be uh, the environment that stymies action is that you don't even know what you want. Mm. And what the SDG goals did was created a very clear framework of what we want and which then if we agreed that they, these were the targets and goals that we were here collectively to deliver upon, then it would, I think, help to foster a much stronger collab collaborative culture around the how we get there because we're not debating what we want anymore. <laughs> um, you know, there is a role for government, there is a role for civil society and there is a role for business and there's a role for knowledge generation in the academic community to deliver on the, this agenda. Um, it isn't for government alone to do it. But having said that, government needs to play its role. It's not... The uh, obligation, for example, on business to ensure that people have a basic adequate income. 
you know, there are other things that business has a role and responsibility to deliver upon, but to not even have um, a government test its own policies against the delivery of these goals means that it undercuts the collaborative effort of others. So, for example, on the end poverty in all its forms, um, what the government did when it doubled the rate of job seeker was it lifted people who are relying on the unemployment payment up out of poverty pre the doubling of the poverty of um, job seeker 88 percent of people relying on job seeker were living in poverty 88 percent when the government doubled the rate uh, of job seek that went down to just 26 percent so that we more in that with that particular group of people we more than achieved the SDG goal virtually overnight um, and that's a very powerful story to tell if we have a national government that cares about it and now what we've got is of course the cutting back of incomes for people who've got the least but at the same time as the government is prosecuting the case for tax cuts for people who are the wealthiest by income measures in Australia. Um, and so the, it cuts across the, the goal 10, which is about ensuring that we are lifting up the incomes of the bottom 40% of the community at at least a rate which is equivalent, if not greater, than the incomes of other people in the country. And so, again, this is a way for us to call out government in terms of its the policies that it's pursuing but we also recognise that we want economic growth because we do want job creation. And so those other goals in the SDG are very powerful as a way to say, but actually evidence also shows that in terms of job creation, the most effective way to create jobs in the community is actually to put more dollars into the hands of people on low incomes because that goes into the economy much faster. We have the evidence to show that. And we estimated that um, increasing job seeker, for example, would create about 145,000 jobs over two years. In contrast to the cost of tax cuts for every job created, it was costing $500,000 these tax cuts which are going to cost the budget in the end about 30 billion now we can have debates when we talk about these issues we can, that can sound like debates between the rich and the poor and values about you know um, greed and and sort of a, a negative framework over this that's an, a divisive debate but the SDGs if we had a government that led with that would say we are evidence-based, these are the collective goals that we have as a country, and we will deliver policies that actually progress them. Mm. This is not about whether one person is better than the other. It's about a shared agenda for us all. So yeah. I, I feel very strongly that this is an important part of um, why it's, it's a value for us as business, as civil society, to lock arms together to say this is a shared agenda for us, and together we go to government to ask them to do their bit. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sandra. I think it got, that links back to Claire's earlier point and the point that we make in the research, which is if there was ever a time that Australia needed to link up these different aspects of sustainability in the context of fires and droughts and pandemics, this is the blueprint. SDGs are the blueprint to take us there. Kylie, let me come to you on this question as well before we open to Q&A in our last, last 15 yeah. minutes. I think some of the, you know, the responses have been, you know, really articulately put and leadership you know generally is important and as is collaboration right like as we've all said collaboration requires multi sorry the achieving the sdgs requires that multi-set stakeholder partnerships and collaboration right we need to mobilize the shared knowledge that we all have the expertise that we have the technology the financial resources etc and that effective collaboration is the avenue for that more inclusive economic and, and transformative growth. So the government does need to take the time to think about how to lead on this at all levels and within all sectors. And, you know, there are very good examples of public-private partnerships that have happened over the years that have been key enablers for system change, right? And if you look at that at the context of the SDGs and Goal 17 around partnerships of the goals, Clearly, that needs more focus and greater promotion to be able to deliver systemic changes and the systemic changes that we're all talking about. So really, if, in our view, like if Australia wants a seat at the global table to be taken really seriously in this space, 
then we need policy mechanisms from the government. We need commitments from all departments and at all levels to put the SDGs into the core of their own operations. And we need commitment at a federal level to consider what positive or negative impacts they're having on the SDGs. You know, as I said earlier, look, we run a public-private partnership called the Bribery Prevention Network, and that's with the Australian Federal Police, the Attorney General's Department, corporate, corporates, a business association, another civil society organisation. And that PPP, like, contributes directly to SDG 16 and 17, but it doesn't get framed in that manner. And I'm pretty sure that if we went to... Um, different government departments framing it in that matter, it, manner, it wouldn't have gone ahead like the way that it has. But those government departments and that PPP has demonstrated the effectiveness of collaboration with the private sector to, in this case, prevent and detect and address um, global and local bribery and corruption. We need more partnerships like these, particularly with the SDGs where we're lagging against. And we also need more federal government MPs and business CEOs and civil society CEOs to advocate for these SDG-aligned policies, right? We need the states and the territory governments to have more influence on national plans because they're well ahead of the federal government in terms of achievement against the Paris Agreement and achievement against the SDGs. Like the Melbourne City Council is a prime example of a company, a, a, sorry, a state government and a local government that has taken you know responsible cities and as a actual mantra for what they're following and they they demonstrated time and time again that their policies and commitments have led to inclusive growth so and cast to this as well right like overarchingly the responsibility of solving the world's problems can't be left to government alone mm. right Principled businesses can and should work alongside government, just like civil society, government, academia and other sectors need to work together to achieve the SDGs. So in our view, the having that continual focus on innovative partnerships and investment with strong leadership across all sectors, including government, is the only way that we're going to have this sort of transformational change, right? Like we, we have to just let go of the the mantra of she'll be right and and move to the mantra of you know we need action now and we need to act now yeah that's really 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 valuable thank you um look we've got so many fantastic questions coming in from the floor and we've only got about seven minutes left so i'm going to pitch a couple at you and ask um and ask you just to be selective and to be as brief as you can in your responses and i'm going to choose them based on the democratic principle of how many people have voted for some of them so let me start with a question um from warwick peel uh, warwick asks do we sometimes need to reframe the dialogue? If the SDGs were a sport and Indonesia came, came first, Mexico second and Germany third, then Australia 100th, does this help politicians and the general public want to fight for better results? Just an example, but does it help to communicate a new narrative? Over to I don't you know if it does. I'll be very brief. I'd like to think that it does, particularly as a, a sports-mad country and we also have a sports-mad you know, um, PM. But we're lagging behind on climate action and that, that's demonstrated time and time again. Like even we're, we're now behind the US, which was, you know, our fallback partner. So there are league, league ladders, for want of a better word, with that and it's not making the ounce of difference. So whilst I like the framing, Warwick, um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure it's got the motivator that we'd like it to have. Mm. Uh, look, I, I just, just, um, I do think, um, of course, um, we, we do have a prime minister who currently says we're ahead of the pack on tackling climate change. In fact, that was in the speech given earlier yes. this week at the Business Council dinner. And so, you know, a, 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 um, facts do matter. Um, and of course, um, we've got the Global Gender Gap Index, which has very clearly um, highlighted just how. Australia has fallen from being up the 15th globally right down to 50th in terms of overall ranking. So I think ranking has its place because it's affirming civil society and business and others who are wanting to be able to track change. That's what these SDGs do. Um, but, again, 
um, we have to have a culture within government that takes this seriously and there are a lot of values attached to what gets to the top of the list in terms of rankings, I think. Mm -hmm. Can I just also, yeah, I just wanted to also add, um, I think that's a great question. Thank you, Warwick. Um, I really do not like global dashboards measuring countries' uh, SDG achievement. So there's a number of global dashboards where, um, you know, all the countries are put in a list and if, you know, SDG 3 target 1 it might have a red light, so, you know, you've not quite achieved SDG 3 target 1, keep going, or might get a green light or an orange light. And, and my, my challenge with these types of global dashboards is, and particularly when you think about it in the Australian context, for example, on some of those global dashboards, Australia has green lights for the SDG 3 good health and wellbeing uh, targets. And that really concerns me because actually what that does is it invisibilises uh, health inequities in this country because what we haven't done in this country is localise those targets to our actual national, subnational contexts. So, um, you know, we shouldn't be having green lights on national, on international dashboards when it comes to the health and wellbeing of our First Nations peoples, for example, people with disabilities, as our Royal Commission findings recently attest. So, um, yes, um, really... Um, uh, treat metrics with caution, especially international SDG dashboards. Yeah. Um, look, I'm going to share with you, um, and maybe, um, Claire, you want to start on this one, a question from Ian Butterworth, who, um, to try and turn this to some constructive possibilities for what we can do, Ian asks, what's an immediate small win that we can pursue collectively to drag our federal government towards symbolic and policy mm -hmm. leadership on the SDGs? Do you want to have a crack yeah. at that? Yeah, of course. Thank you. And Ian, this is a, a terrific question because I agree the small and incremental wins. And what I'm going to suggest, I suggest with great respect at this United Nations Association Forum, but what I suggest is we stop calling it or government stops calling it the UN SDG agenda. And that was particularly the wording that was used in the 2018 parliamentary inquiry into the SDG agenda, and I find that language very problematic. And I've been guilty of I've, I've referred to the UN SDG agenda in the past um, as a publication in the Medical Journal of Australia attests. And I think we need to work with government to ensure that they remove the United Nations from the SDG discourse. The federal government needs to take ownership. So what I think it would be a small but triumphant win was that. The Australian government started talk of, to talk about Australia's and an Australian sustainable development goal agenda or sustainable development agenda. Um, Thanks, Claire. I'm going to pass to the others just because we've, we've only got four minutes to go and I wanted to get in one more question if we can. Cass, um, Kylie? Look, I think there's so many quick wins. Like we could be talking about quick wins for, for a while. I do agree that it's important to localise the meaning of the SDGs. Um, I think a quick win would be going back to having representatives across every government department who is responsible for the SDGs and is responsible for engaging and those people are held to account for engaging with different sectors on the SDGs. So at least there is some form of report back mechanism going into government about what different sectors are doing. Thank you, Kylie. Great, great practical one. Cass, any ideas? Are we looking for quick wins only from government? Um, because today what I'd love is the business community to also say we don't want high-end tax cuts because it's contrary to the SDGs and we stand locking arms together um, on what we need to do as a country and we're going to say that to the government. We don't want these either. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you, Kat, for that one. Um, look, I want to, before we say, uh, say our farewells, I just wanted to give a shout-out to Jude Walker's question. Um, it's a long question, but his basic point is who's talking about the issue of youth unemployment in the context of SDG and how can we do more on that front? 
It, it, look, the issue is extremely important and we know from what happened with the global financial crisis, with younger people who were particularly affected, many people did not get a first foot in the door in terms of employment opportunity coming out of um, education and there was a long tail of um, 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 unemployment as a result and we can absolutely know and predict that that is the same thing that will happen again um, with the kind of policy settings that the government is now bringing back in. So cutting away at the unemployment payment, the youth allowance, you know, plunging young people into even deeper poverty than older people actually. Um, and also, you know, nasty mutual obligations that don't help anybody um, and not investing properly in, in, in a, a appropriate employment services. Australia um, um, has less than half the the national average in terms of expenditure on employment services. And so and we are not seeing the government take any of those policies seriously. However, I do see, um, again, really important opportunities for business leaders and for civil society to do what we can, because we know for everybody um, what will help in terms of um, the reducing the risk of unemployment is relationships. Resources, yep. yeah. etc. But the closer you can get to a real employer who's going to give you a break to give give you an employment experience, the more powerful that will be for that young person. So yep. we really yeah. work with government, uh, with business, and we are um, on that agenda, regardless of you know whether we can get government where we'd like them. Yep. Yeah. Um, sorry to the other panelists. Got the wrap up call now for the other session. So sorry if you had more to say, and sorry to people whose questions we didn't get to. There were some fantastic ones there, and they've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, UNAA will share the research, and I noticed someone particularly wanted um, the the matrix, momentum matrix. So we'll make sure that that's shared. It just leaves it for me to say thank you to these fantastic panellists for sharing their insights with all of us. Thank you to UNAA um, and particularly Sophie Arnold for convening this very important forum. And thanks to all of you for joining us for the session. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.